Uh, thanks, Caroline. Um, so it's uh, my pleasure to introduce um, Alec Chu, who is a um, bioinformatics PhD student. Um, Alec has been uh, thinking quite extensively about uh, dimensionality reduction algorithms for uh, genomic data sets. Take it away, Alec. Okay, so I think it should be sharing now. Um, yes. Okay, cool. Okay, um, yeah, so uh, thanks, Shriram, for the introduction. So today I'll be talking about um, inferring population structure inference or inferring population structure for biobank scale data. Um, so just to kind of begin, uh, I want to talk about what population structure um, is in the first place. So, very broadly speaking, um, it's some sort of inherent grouping or structure within the data. That can really be due to uh, lots of different things. So one example could be geography. Um, and in previous um, study, we actually ran um, a simple PCA on um, the UK Biobank, British individuals, and we could actually find that there was a north-south um, differentiation between uh, individuals that was just found by genetic data. Likewise, it can also be due to things like batch effects. So um, in this case, it's, this is some methylation data where running the PCA actually separates it by the platform that they were sequenced or um, I guess uh, measured on. And then another big one is ancestry. Uh, and it's often the one that comes out uh, most prominently in genetics studies. And that's what largely the focus of this talk will be on. Um, so for those of you that have done these direct to consumer types of kits like 23andMe or Ancestry.com, this might look familiar to you. Um, and this is actually my own from 23andMe where they'll spin to this, this tube and they'll sequence it and essentially tell you where um, you came from. So based on your DNA, they'll try to map you to specific regions. And so for me, it's unfortunately not very interesting, um, but for others, it can be quite interesting where you have portions from many different sources. And so this, this brings us to a definition that I want to bring up called global ancestry. And so how we define global ancestry is that it's really two things. It's the admixture of portions of a modern individual, and it's the allele frequencies of those populations. So in this kind of example from 23andMe, we have the proportions or percentage from each of these reference populations. So that would be the one part, which is often the main point of interest for a lot of these algorithms and in this problem. Um, and likewise, we would also need the allele frequencies for these reference populations. Um, and it's quite important to, to infer population structure because it has a lot of applications. So um, one that many people are familiar with is that in genome-wide association studies, it can often, population structure can often confound results. So correcting for that is often an important thing to make sure that the findings are uh, robust. Um, in addition, it can also be used for disease, disease gene mapping and also can tell us about evolutionary history. Um, so mathematically, how we can kind of view global ancestry is that um, you'll have an individual specific allele frequency and your genotypes can be thought of as being drawn from a binomial distribution and in humans that would be two, um, uh, parameterized by two and whatever frequency you have individually. And the idea of this individual specific allele frequency is that you are some sort of weighted combination of different reference populations. So based on your specific proportions, you are some sort of weighted combination. So in the example I gave before, there are several different ancestries and you are some sort of weighted combination of those ancestries. And so combining those together, you get some sort of personalized frequency for yourself and your data will be drawn from that personalized frequency. Um, and so with this, there are also some constraints. So for instance, the P, which is this matrix of allele frequencies has to be between zero and one because we cannot have frequencies that are beyond one or below zero. And likewise, your membership proportions or your admixture proportions cannot be negative and they do have to add up to one because we can't have more than 100% of a person or we can't have negative percents um, in terms of ancestries. And so more formally, this is 
um, can be referred to as the structure model or sometimes the admixture model. And the fun fact is that this model was originally proposed in 2000 um, by population geneticists, although machine learning scientists later took the same model and kind of relabeled it as latent Dirichlet allocation, um, but ultimately they are the same model. Um, and so when we're doing this kind of problem, our goal is to ultimately take your data and kind of decompose it into this P and this Q matrix, or in other words, your ancestral real frequencies and admixture proportions. And again, usually the goal is to grab these admixture proportions. So this is not really a new problem um, in the sense that there are many methods that can estimate this. So in these sorts of graphs, we took some data from the thousand genome population um, and how you can interpret these kinds of graphs is that if you zoom in, you can actually, there are actually lines and each line represents an individual and these different bars represent the admixture proportions. So in this case, each of these colors represents a different population um, and vertically it represents a person's membership. So in this sort of case, we ran some existing methods. Most notably one is admixture, which is kind of the gold standard and one of the most commonly used methods in the field and um, a fun coincidence is that it is act, was actually developed um, here at UCLA by Ken Lang um, or Ken Lang's group um, back in the mid 2000s. Um, but the idea here is that you can see when we compare to the self-identified um, ancestry or continental ancestry from the thousand genomes, we can see that um, this darker grayer color um, is representing people who self-identify as African ancestry, and that's purely dominated by these red colors. And then the East Asian is these orange tones. Um, the South Asians is this darker green. And then um, this purple or pink color um, is dominated by these, this light blue. And then um, in the Americas, where people are admixed, um, we see that um, there is some admixture, but there is also some uniqueness within this group. So this was on a data set that was containing 1,718 individuals and about 1.8 million SNPs. So the problem with that we're trying to tackle is that these methods do not really scale to large sample sizes. So for a data set of this size, admixture takes 31 hours to complete. Um, another method, AL structure takes 11 hours, fast structure takes eight hours, and terrace structure takes four hours. So on a data set of this size, it already takes so a good amount of time for many of these methods to run. So when we scale to things like the UK Biobank, which are hundreds of thousands of individuals, um, it can be very time consuming and prohibitive to run these sorts of analyses on these biobanks. And so in particular, we wanted to ask how we could tackle this problem. And we looked at the, the models that all these kind of operate under, and we were particularly we were interested in AL structure. Um, so to kind of give you an idea of how AL structure um, works uh, in a basic sense is that we'll start with our data, which we'll label X here. So these are your genotypes. And you'll use a technique called latent subspace estimation, which is a generalization of PCA, um, which is a slight mo slightly modified, although not too different from PCA, um, to estimate this individual specific allele frequency, which we denote F. And then from there, we need to factorize this. So we use a pretty commonly known machine learning algorithm called alternating these squares. And this will let us factorize um, into the, the individual allele specific, um, individual specific allele frequencies into these ancestral allele frequencies and the admixture proportions. So it's a relatively simple algorithm when we think about it in these two steps, but um, it was still very prohibitive in terms of um, both time consumption and resource consumption. So what we did is we developed a new method called SCOPE, um, which is short for scalable population structure inference. And we added two major computational speed ups. So the first would be that we have several methods for fast PCA approximation. So we can integrate that into this first step of latent subspace estimation since it is essentially, oops, essentially a um, generalization and slight modification of PCA. And we also added another algorithm into this called the mailman algorithm. And what that essentially allows us to do is to speed up any computations that involve the genotype matrix. And additionally, we also added another feature that is absent from most methods, um, which is the allow or to allow people to use 
um, supervised analysis for th this type of admixture um, inference. And the idea of that is that a user can supply some sort of ancestral refrequencies from some sort of reference population, such as the thousand genomes, and use that to infer the admixture proportions. So very briefly talking about um, each of these two steps, the first would be these fast PCA approximations. So the fast PCA approximations are actually fairly well known from the literature, and it's actually been uh, widely used in genetics for a while. Um, and there are a lot of methods, including one of our own, ProPCA, that have implemented um, scalable uh, PCA approximations. And they largely belong to one of two methods, um, but there are several methods and it's been around for several years, so, such as fast PCA, which has been around for several years. So essentially what we did is we took one of these methods and we integrated it into our own algorithm. Uh, and specifically we used the same kind of um, strategy that flash PCA2 um, utilizes. And then the other big part of this um, was the mailman algorithm. And the basic idea of the mailman algorithm is that you, when you have a matrix with a fixed number of values inside it, so inside, for our case, inside the genotype matrix, it's all values of zero, one, or two, um, at least for humans. And because it's only one of those three values, we can utilize that property to speed up computations. And the basic idea is that we can take our matrix. So in this example, there's um, only two values, zero and one, and we can essentially enumerate the different possibilities of this. So in this case, for these two values, you either have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And we essentially make the, the, another matrix that picks out which of these columns are. So for this first one, it's the first column. So hence there's one here, the second one is the second one, and then the third one um, would be the third one here. Um, so we essentially pick out the which of the possible combinations it is. And so we can utilize um, some other properties of matrices to essentially use this in combination with um, the mailman algorithm. And we can boost the runtime of uh, these computations. So for us, we did this with the genotype matrix. And because we're repeatedly using the genotype matrix in many of our combinations, this provides a speed up, but essentially, because we do need to store some of these um, combinations, we do need to exchange a little bit of memory for this runtime boost. So putting these things together, we incorporate it into a method called scope. And so the first thing that we wanted to assess under this method was whether it's accurate under standard simulations. So we did a basic simulation under the admixture or structure model and we obtain parameters to simulate that from real data, specifically the 1000 Genomes Project and another um, big data set called the Human Genome Diversity Project. And in our sort of graphs qualitatively, you can kind of see that our method scope does kind of match what other methods get, but also what the, the ground truth is for our simulations. And so this is a data set that's not too large, 10,000 individuals by 10,000 SNPs, but ultimately we find that it does scale and I, it actually has very good accuracy. So um, we compared it against each of these methods and how we can interpret this table is we measured against root mean square error and also Jensen-Shannon divergence. Um, and we, we ran this for all the other methods on the data sets that we could um, get it to scale to, but for some methods that don't scale well, um, we couldn't run it for those larger data sets. But for instance, for admixture, we do find that uh, it tends to be better under this simulation setting, although it can't scale on the max it could scale, we could get it to scale to in our simulations with 10,000 to 1 million. Um, and likewise, other methods also are somewhat prohibitive in terms of their scalability, but we do find that uh, we get very comparable or better accuracy than most of these other methods. And then likewise, we also wanted to test how robust this method is. So we essentially create another set of simulations that are under something called the spatial model. And the idea of this is that we're going to place our reference populations on a line, and then we'll put each individual somewhere on this line. So in this case, the square represents the individual. And so because this individual is closer to this red population, it's going to have most of this, most of its ancestry coming from this red population. And then the next closest one is this green population in the middle. 
So we'll have the next most from that. And then this blue population is quite far away. So we'll have a very small contribution from that. And so in terms of these admixture graphs, this is kind of how it looks where you have this red and there's almost no blue. And on the vice versa of that, when you have a lot of this blue, you have very little of this red. And so this is a, a direct violation of the admixture model because this is not something that's really incorporated to any of these models. Um, and there's not really a relationship between the admixture proportions and the standard model. And again, we also use frequencies um, for the simulations from real data. And so um, again, we can kind of see that some of these methods break down. So for instance, fast structure almost completely breaks down um, when in the presence of this model violation. Um, but we do find that some of these methods, including our own, can actually um, handle this, this violation in some sense. And so this was a, on a data set of 10,000 by 100,000 individuals. Um, and ultimately we find that our method is actually able to do a lot better, um, but in general, all the methods kind of do a little bit worse compared to the um, standard admixture or structure model. Um, but for the most part, we do see um, improvements and, and find that our model is quite robust under both of our metrics of root mean square error and jensen shannon divergence. And so probably what is most astounding about our method is that it's orders of magnitude faster than other methods. Um, so compared to admixture on the largest data set it could run, it was 10,000 by 1 million. And that took admixture about 35 hours to run, but our method only took 13 minutes to do that. Um, and for fast structure, uh, it could only run on the max or in terms of scalability on the same size that we ran admixture on. And that took actually 114 hours, but again, ours was only 13 minutes. And for an even larger data set of 100,000 individuals by 1 million individuals, um, tear structure, which is the most scalable out of these other methods, took 237 hours, but we were able to reduce that down to two hours. Um, and on a smaller data set, um, which this method AL structure ran on, takes 22 minutes, but we can reduce that down to five seconds. Um, and in terms of memory, we did say that we did need to take a little bit more memory usage because of some of the overhead from the mailman algorithm, but we ultimately find that it's not too much memory. Um, and so compared to some other methods, we use a little bit more, so about like two, three gigs more of, of RAM um, than some of these other methods. But we do find that once it starts to scale up to larger sample sizes that we have comparable memory usage. Um, and additionally, we ran one other um, simulation that was very large for um, the standard model uh, was it was the 1 million by 1 million data set, which um, by itself was already about a quarter of a terabyte in size. And we were able to run this in about 24 hours, but we do have a lot of memory usage for this. Um, and then likewise, under the spatial model where there's a relationship between these admixture proportions, uh, we do find that the methods do generally take longer, but we find that our method is still able to perform very well. Um, and a lot faster than some of these other methods. So for instance, with admixture, it took 284 hours, but we were able to reduce this down to nine minutes. Um, and for even more of the scalable methods, we were still able to reduce it. And overall, we found that um, across all our simulations um, and different runs that our method is anywhere from threefold faster to 1800 fold faster, um, which is a pretty remarkable um, speed up. So we also, Really, the, the point of this work was really that we wanted to build a scalable method. And the biobank that we really look at a lot is the UK biobank, which is about half a million individuals. Um, and so we ran our method on the UK biobank. So specifically, we ran it on a subset of it that has uh, 488,000 individuals and about uh, 550 or 70K um, SNPs. And so we ran this with four lane populations. So we wanted to infer it using uh, four different populations and we were able to get this to complete in about a day or a little over a day. Um, and it still has uh, not too much of a prohibitive uh, memory requirement, but um, it's, it's pretty remarkable that we were able to get this to, to finish in about a day. And um, so in these sorts of graphs, you both ran it in our supervised mode where we supplied it frequencies from the thousand genomes project and we also ran it unsupervised. And between the two, there's not really too much of a difference qualitatively, um, but we do find that it actually agrees pretty well with the self-identified ethnicity um, that individuals in the UK Biobank reported. Um, 
And so to assess that a little bit more quantitatively, what we did is we, we trained a logistic regression classifier. Um, and so we, we fed it as input, the proportions either from the supervised model or this unsupervised model. We were able to find that on the labels provided by the UK Biobank, we could get about 82% accuracy. Um, however, one thing with that is that there are often these ambiguous labels. So for instance, there's this do not know or any other mixed background. Um, so when we remove some of these more ambiguous labels, we were able to boost that up to uh, about 95, 96% uh, classification accuracy. Um, but overall, we do find that um, there is this high agreement with the self-identified ethnicity. Um, so just to kind of conclude, what we've done here is that we um, introduced this method called scope that can infer population structure um, orders of magnitude faster than existing methods while still uh, maintaining this competitive accuracy. And we also find that our method is actually robust to model violations. Um, and there are ways that we can also extend our method. So um, we currently have modes to run in a supervised fashion where you supply the uh, frequencies for your populations and as well on, as the unsupervised method where you don't have to supply anything except the genotype data. Um, but it is possible for us to potentially extend this to be a mixture of those two where you have some populations where you do know what the frequencies are, but you also have some that you don't know. Um, and likewise, a lot of the framework um, used in scope can be extended for other data types, such as count-based data. Um, so that's something that we are thinking about as well. Um, so our method is available at, at uh, our lab's GitHub, and we also include ver various simulation scripts and visualization scripts and um, real data filtering um, at this repository as well. And we're hoping to have a preprint coming out in the next week or so. Uh, and so lastly, I'd like to acknowledge um, several members of the lab. So Aaron is a postdoc um, who helps quite a bit on this project. And of course, Sriram as, the, as my faculty advisor, as well as um, Amit Tawakar and Eric from uh, Carnegie Mellon who helped with the, the early steps of this project. Um, and I'd also like to thank Bogdan um, Pasanuik and members of his lab for a lot of comments um, throughout and feedback throughout the, this project. And of course, other members from our own lab. Um, and also I'd like to thank my funding sources. So the NSF NRT Mentor Fellowship and as well as the GATP um, program. Thank you, Alec. We have time for questions. So I have a question. Um, yeah. So first of all, is, is this the first case where you can use a supervised approach to do a mixture? So uh, most of these population structure inference methods don't use supervision. Ad, um, among the methods we tested, the only other one that can do this is admixture. Um, however, because of the scalability, um, like we still get comparable performance when we assess both of those in a supervised fashion, uh, but admixture still takes much longer to, to complete this than um, our method. Also, I just have a follow-up question. Um, the supervised portion comes from the allele frequency, right? What about yes. like the population origin? Can you also do that? So, um, I don't know if I necessarily understand what you mean by like the population origin. Um, so the 1000 genomes reference panel, um, yeah. those samples are, you know, you, you know, their origin, right? You yeah, also yeah. know so, that. So, so here, like how we do it is essentially we supply the frequencies from each of these populations. So it doesn't have to necessarily have like labels. Um, you could take the estimated frequencies from like a previous run of this method or another method um, and supply that as well. But in this case, we supplied the 1000 genomes specifically because we did know where they came from. So in this specific case, we do know exactly what um, each of these colors is I referring see. to. I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. So I guess Alec, a follow up to that question and maybe that, that was my interpretation of that question was, you could imagine supervision coming in two forms. One is uh, you're given the allele frequencies. The other one is you're told um, which uh, population of an individual belongs to. Yeah. And so the question is, which kind of supervision is currently supported? Yeah, so, so we don't currently support where you supply the population. Um, we only support where you supply the, the allele frequencies. So 
Um, if you do have population labels, you can easily use a program to estimate frequencies within that population and then use that as input for this supervision. Great, thank you, thank you. Can I ask a question too? Um, I wondered if you had applied this to any other data set, especially like ones that are are like the Atlas data set, for example, at UCLA. So, I was yeah, so we, we applied it to a couple other of the public ones. So we applied it to the Thousand Genomes Project, the Human Genomes Diversity Project, and the Human Origins data set. Um, but we did not apply it to um, the Atlas Biobank yet. Um, and for the most that would part, be really exciting. Yeah, it, lar it largely agrees with a lot of these other methods for um, the real data sets. Um, but I chose to focus here a little bit on the UK Biobank since we're the only method capable of scaling to this size. Cool. 